turning this morning to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, and then we're going to be reading also from chapter two, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse one. Would you stand with me if you're able while we read? For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the fi- <clears throat> by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 9, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, He is able to succor them that are tempted. My text this morning is found in chapter 10 of this epistle to the Hebrews and verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. I want to talk to you this morning about a body for the Son of God. The story of the redemption of sinful man is a marvelous story of divine grace. It began in the purpose of God before the foundation of the world 
when God the Son, the second person of the divine trinity, was foreordained to become the savior of sinful man. It continued in the fullness of time. When God the Son laid aside existence in the form of God to become forever united with human nature. Only because the nature of mankind bears a likeness to God was it possible for the Son of God to take upon himself our likeness. The Hebrew writer focuses on the marvelous account of the incarnation from the divine perspective. We love the story as recorded in the gospel records of the incarnation of the Son, the angel Gabriel appearing to the Virgin Mary, announcing that she has become the chosen vessel to bear the babe who would be the Son of God. We see the agony of her espoused husband as she's found great with child and his wrestling with what to do until the angel manifests himself to Joseph. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The marvelous providence of God that through an edict of the emperor of Rome made possible the fulfillment of the ancient scripture that <clears throat> the Son of God would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. The anger and jealousy of King Herod and <clears throat> the angel warning Joseph to take the babe and flee to Egypt. Upon his return when Herod is dead, choosing to go to Nazareth where in relative obscurity Jesus, the Son of God, would be raised to maturity as the God-man. Beautiful, wonderful story, the incarnation of the Son of God. But here in Hebrews, we see it from a different perspective. Here is the view of the Son of God himself. A body hast thou prepared me a body for the Son of God, a body to become the medium through which he would deal redemptively with sin in the human race. An enemy had infected the human race, sin. When Adam had sinned, it ensured that all of us would be born with a sinful corruption of nature something that we were incapable of any uh, way of ridding ourselves from. But a body hast thou prepared me. A body in which he came to deal redemptively with sin. Sin in the human race. Sin in its inception. Sin in its horrid degradation sin in all of its forms, sin committed by the willful, deliberate acts of transgression, sin as a resident corruption within the heart of man. A body hast thou prepared me to deal redemptively with sin. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, the dominion of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The human race, infected now with sin, was incapable of delivering itself. Sin had destroyed 
in mankind the moral image of God in which he had been created. Sin had brought all of mankind into a state of enmity with God, where God could have no pleasure in him. Sin had placed mankind under the sentence of divine wrath. Sin had alienated mankind from God. All of us were involved in that condemnation, in that infection. In time past, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But a body hast thou prepared me, a body by which he would deal redemptively with sin in mankind. God could not save mankind without dealing a death blow to sin. A death blow to sin as committed transgressions and as a resident disposition within the heart of man. If he was to save mankind, if mankind was to be redeemed, God must deal the death blow to sin. As an outsider to the human race, God was powerless to deal an effective death blow to sin and yet save the sinner. He could not act in conflict with his own holy nature. His love could not act against his righteous indignation. He could declare his holy laws, command sinners to keep them as he did at Mount Sinai, but without the incarnation, he could not give sin a death blow. He could demonstrate, uh, he could remonstrate with sinners about their sins and admonish them to repent as he did with Cain, but he could not destroy the beast of sin in the hearts of men without the incarnation. He could bring divine judgment as he did on the antediluvian generation in the flood, and as he did on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Abraham, but he could not change the heart of men from loving sin to loving God without a body being prepared for him. His omnipotence was powerless to deal a death blow to sin, without destroying mankind as he had made him. Because sin involves a moral action against God, God could not simply destroy it without a moral action on the part of man. To bring about the destruction of sin, God must become man. God must lay aside existence in the form of God and enter the human race as a man. Only from the plane of human nature could God enter into mortal combat with sin in the human race. Only from humanity would he be able to deal a death blow to sin. Since the first Adam acting as the representative and head of the human race, had brought sin and death upon all mankind, there must be a second Adam who would act as the representative for the human race in redemptive grace. For since by man came death, by man must come also resurrection from the dead. He who knew no sin must be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
He must become identified before the Father with all of our sinfulness that God might deal in him redemptively with your sin and with mine. And so, without ceasing to be who he had been from all eternity, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Here then is the savior of sinners, divinely appointed from the foundation of the world, yearning for a human body in which he could act to destroy sin in the human race. Through millennia, of grieving while sin raged rampant on the earth through successive generations of spiritual preparation among men until at last the fullness of time had come. The Son of God had waited, waited for the moment when he would have a body in which to deal the death blow to sin. Finally, the moment had come. The angel Gabriel had announced God's purpose to the astonished virgin, and she had yielded her full and willing consent to the plan. A body had been prepared for the Son of God, a body in which he would deal redemptively with sin. A body for the Son of God as the means of sacrifice for sins. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. When God entered the human race to deal with, redemptively with the sin of humanity. It was that he might become the sacrifice for sin. The victory against sin would not be won by the assumption and exercise of sovereign political power, forcing all mankind to submit to him as their king. It would not be won by the power of military might. God breaking forth on his enemies with mighty power as he did when David went against the Philistines. The victory would not be gained by the power of persuasive argument, not by intellectual genius, not by the brilliance of oratorical persuasion, not by the winsomeness of a magnanimous personality, not by the education of the masses, not by the refinement of culture, not by earthly riches or economic prosperity, not by the elimination of poverty. It would not be gained by any means that the world values and puts its esteem on. Victory would only come through apparent weakness. It would only come through apparent defeat. It would come not by self-exaltation, but by self-abasement. Not by carnal self-defense, but by divinely directed self-surrender. Not by slaying his enemies, but by allowing himself to be slain by his enemies. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things which are. 
so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. God instituted a system of animal sacrifice as the provisionary means for the expiation of sin until the moment would come when a body would be prepared for the Son of God. But rivers of animal blood could never take away a single sin in mankind. And our moral creature is incapable of becoming a substitute for a moral being who deliberately exercised his moral choice against God. Only as a type of the Lamb of God, who in anticipation would take away the sin of the world by the sacrifice of himself, could God pass over the sins of mankind and grant mercy until the moment when a body would be prepared for the Son of God. The only sacrifice which could satisfy divine justice would be the offering up of one whose nature corresponded with our humanity, yet without sin, and yet whose stature measured to the infinite stature of God himself against whom we had sinned. The only sacrifice that could take away sin would be the willing substitution of the God-man to die in our place, to take upon himself the penalty that our sin deserved, to suffer for us so that we would not have to suffer the penalty of our sins. God is God, could not become the substitute for sinners. God, God, who has life in himself, could never provide a sacrifice for the sins of mankind apart from the incarnation, apart from a body being prepared for the Son of God. Only as the Son of God would lay aside existence in the form of God to become united with human nature could he provide such a sacrifice for us, such a substitute that would satisfy the demands of divine justice and allow God to be just and yet the justifier of him that believes in Jesus a body hast thou prepared me, a body to become a sacrifice, a sacrifice in substitution for you and for me. For 33 years, Jesus lived among men as the Son of Man, looking always toward the cross and his resurrection as the hour of his triumph. At the outset of his ministry, Simeon recognized he had come to be a sacrifice. To his mother, he said, a sword shall pierce thine own heart also. When John came to introduce the Son of God to the nation of Israel, he said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That was the purpose of, for which he had come. He tried to communicate that to his disciples. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. But they didn't comprehend, they didn't understand, they didn't grasp the significance of why he had come. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This shall not be unto thee. But Jesus with resolute will said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. 
Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Only by the medium of sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself, could he deal a death blow to sin in the human race. On one occasion, he said to his disciples, I am come to send fire on the earth. He wasn't talking about the fire of divine judgment. He didn't have to come to do that. But he was talking about the fire of a living passion of love for God in the hearts of men. He wanted to spread all through the human race a flame of divine love for himself. But he must deal the death blow to sin if that was to become a reality. He said, and what will I if it be already kindled, or how I wish, how I yearn, how I long that it would be already kindled. But he said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened until it be accomplished. I'm hemmed in. I cannot do my mighty work until it take place. And so he fought his way through every hindrance, every opposition of the enemy, until finally he said, the hour is come. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, he said, is my soul troubled, troubled at the prospect, not so much his physical suffering, but what he knew was the cost of being the Lamb of God. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this very cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. A body hast thou prepared me to become the sacrifice for the sins of humanity. For the sin resident within the hearts that has overflowed in vile, corrupt, wicked deeds unspeakable deeds, all of those transgressions that flowed out of that corruption of nature. And I'm glad to tell you that he did not come in vain when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And I'm glad to tell you in that sacrifice, He accomplished the purpose for which he came. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Thank God he accomplished the purpose for which he came. In the agony of his blood, in the agony of of the cross, in the agony of separation from the Father, he paid the price that he might deal redemptively with sin, sins that you have committed, sin that is resident within your heart. His blood made atonement for you. A body hast thou prepared me, a body as the medium of opening the way into the holiest, where we can enter into the most intimate fellowship with God. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, 
Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, uh, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There in the inner sanctum of the tabernacle, God promised to dwell among the children of Israel. There above the mercy seat between the cherubim, he would communicate with the children of Israel. But there was a veil that separated between the daily ministry of the priest and that divine presence that dwelt in the inner sanctum. Only once in the year was the high priest permitted to go behind the veil with the blood of sacrifice, which he would sprinkle upon the, the mercy seat and before the mercy seat to make atonement for the nation of Israel. But when the Son of God shed his blood on Calvary's cross, when he cried, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And the way was open for us to enter into the most intimate fellowship with God. With every spiritual impediment removed. With no consciousness of sin within us. A conscious now of a consciousness of purity until we can have an intimate oneness with Him. All who are sanctified are one with Him through the shed blood of the Lamb. And He says to us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and having our body washed with the labor of regeneration. Oh, let us draw near. The, the veil has been rent. The provision has been made. There is no impediment now to our entering into the uh, intimate presence of God. The blood has been shed because a body was prepared for the Son of God, a body for the Son of God, a body as a medium of leading many sons unto glory. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, behold I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same Uniting with us in our humanity, Christ became for us the captain of our salvation. That's an interesting designation. It denotes one that takes the lead in anything. One who uh, uh, affords an example, a predecessor in a matter, a pioneer, one who blazes the way for others. As the Son of God, the captain of our salvation, Jesus, Jesus became our file leader who made the way open before us in facing the enemy of our souls. As the Son of Man, He took upon Himself the responsibility of blazing a way for us to follow him. He faced every enemy that we face. In the power of the Holy Ghost, he triumphed in victory. After his baptism, you remember, he was driven of the Spirit in the wilderness 
into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And for 40 days he was assaulted in the fiercest assaults that the devil could mount against him. But he maintained that commitment to walk in the spirit. And he came forth victorious and triumphant. And as we face the assault of the enemy, I want to tell you he has blazed a trail through every enemy that we'll face. And he can lead us through in victory, in the triumph of his grace. We don't need to go down under anything the enemy brings against us. There's power in the blood of Jesus to take us all the way through. As the captain of our salvation, he opened himself to the full power of sin. He allowed sin to do to him everything that sin could do. Sin exhausted its power on the Son of God. He knew the awful cost of separation from the Father. And it wrenched from his heart that cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But I want to tell you, when sin had exhausted its power on him, he broke the chains of sin and of death, and he came forth triumphant and victorious, that we might live in him, that he might fill us with himself, and lead every one of us through every enemy to victory. Oh, thank God a body has now prepared me. A body for the Son of God that he might come into mortal combat with your sin and with mine. Oh, that he might open a way for us who have sinned into the very holy of holies with God himself. That he might lead us through every battle in triumphant victory until one day we stand with him and he presents us before the Father. Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Have you allowed him to deal with sin in you? Oh, let him deal with sin in you. The price has already been paid. You don't have to stand back in wonder and think, can he do what I need done? I want to tell you there's power in the blood. Power in the blood of Jesus to meet every need of every heart. Whatever your sin problem this morning, I want to tell you the Lamb of God has come. His blood has been shed. You can be forgiven of every sin. You can be cleansed from every stain. You can be filled with His Spirit and live triumphant and victorious until death shall bring us to Him. I want us to stand at the close of this service. Would you, could we take time to turn to number 66 in our hymnal? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Oh, thank God. There's power in the blood. Whatever your need is, are you assaulted 
by uh, the forces of hell. I want to tell you there's power in the blood. Whatever need you have this morning, there's power in the blood of Jesus. You just mind God.